When my SLK went in for its last MOT test, it passed, but with an advisory that the front brake pads were running low, so I decided it was about time I learned to change brake pads. I also wanted to do the fluid at the same time because I'd boiled it quite severely on a track day and the brakes felt really, really soft, but we'll cover that in another video. This video is specifically about changing the front brake pads on a 2004 SLK 280, but it should apply to any R171 Mark II SLK and maybe some of the others. As a first step, I recommend opening the bonnet and taking the lid off the brake fluid reservoir. This will make things easier later. Also, check that the reservoir isn't too full as we'll be pushing some liquid back into it from the brake calipers. Now we need to get the wheels off so we can get at the brakes. If you're using brute force and a breaker bar to undo the bolts, it's best to loosen them slightly before you lift the car up. This ensures that whatever abuse you have to give to the bar to break them loose isn't going to shake the car off the axle stands. Sometimes wheel bolts can be done up very, very tightly by garages with impact drivers, and if so, a long breaker bar and perhaps an additional piece of pipe to make it even longer is going to be your friend. We didn't have any problems with that, as I was able to borrow an impact driver, which made it quick work of loosening the bolt. The jacking points on the SLK are really easy to find. Looking at the underside of the sill, there are some very obvious strengthen points with rubber pads for the jack. Put your jack under here and lift the car up. Once it's up, it's best to put axle stands under it to keep it safe. We don't need to go under the car for this job, but we don't want to risk dropping it on the brake discs, so we're going to play it safe. With the SLK, I've put the axle stands under the suspension pivots. I have seen suggestions of using the bar between the engine mount and the sills, however I've also seen warnings from people who've bent that bar, so I'd be much more comfortable using the suspension pivot. Now that the car's safely raised up at the front, completely undo and remove the bolts from the front wheels. You will probably need to use a special socket for a locking wheel nut for one of them. Keep the wheels safe, you'll need them later. The next step is to undo the bolts in the calipers. These were very rusty on my car, so I sprayed them with WD-40 before starting and gave it a few minutes to soak in. I then turned the steering wheel to make it easier to access the bolts at the rear of the caliper, although this was only really necessary because we were using the impact driver to undo them. We were then able to undo them with a 12mm socket. These bolts should also be completely removed. Now the caliper can be slid out, although you might find it needs a bit of a wiggle to get it moving. When you're doing the front right brake, make sure you unplug the wear sensor from the caliper before you remove it. Or you'll break it, just like I did. If you do break it, don't worry, they're not expensive, but you will have a warning message pop up every time you start the car until you replace it. You can short the wear sensor with a piece of wire connecting the two pins directly together, but I don't really recommend disabling safety equipment on the car. It's worth having some way of hanging the caliper while you're working on the pads. They can dangle on the hose like this, but it's probably better not to. Here I bent a wire coat hanger into a hook that allowed me to hang the caliper by a bolt hole in the wheel well. The first time I didn't use anything and hanging off the brake hose doesn't seem to have harmed it, but I wouldn't recommend it. With the caliper out of the way, the old pads will slide outwards fairly easily in their runners, although they might be a bit stiff to get out and need another wiggle. You'll want to hang on to one of them as it will come in very useful in the next step, compressing the caliper. As the brake pads wear down, the piston in the caliper needs to come out further to press the pads against the disc, and it doesn't get pulled back in again when you release the brake, it just stops pushing. This means that in order to fit the nice chunky new pads in, we're going to need to push it back in to where it belongs. To do this, place one of the old pads over the caliper piston to spread the force, and then use a G-clamp to apply pressure to squeeze the caliper piston back into place. This takes quite a lot of force, you'll need to twist hard and make sure it goes all the way in. From experience, I can tell you that you need at least a 4 inch G clamp for this. A 3 inch one won't open far enough. The next step is to fit the new pads. It's best to grease the back of the pads and the channels it runs in with copper grease, uh, but I didn't have any so I used some lithium grease instead. The pads then slide back into the runners, up against the disc. Make sure you get them the right way round with the wear sensor clip on the inner pad. Fit the wear sensor to the new pad, and as you refit the caliper, poke the connector through the hole in the caliper. Now, you should be able to fit the caliper back over the pads and back into position. The wear sensor will plug back into its socket. 
If your brake pads came with new bolts, use these to hold the caliper in place. If not, you'll just have to reuse the old ones. These should screw back in without any difficulty, although wiggle the caliper if they won't go in. These should be tightened up to 26 newton meters, or about 18 to 20 foot pounds for those of you in strange foreign parts. Now, if you're not doing the brake fluid as well, replace the wheel. It can be lifted straight into position, but you'll probably need to adjust it and fiddle with it a bit until the holes in the wheel line up with the holes in the hub. The bolts can now be slid back into place and tightened as much as you can without putting excess force on the car. And don't worry, we'll tighten them up properly in a moment. We're now basically finished on this side, so jack the car back up so you can retrieve the axle stand, lower it down, and tighten the wheel box to 110 newton meters in a star pattern like this. Now you get to do it all again on the other side for the other front brake, because brakes should always be changed in pairs to keep them even. At least it will be much easier this time, because you already know what you're doing. I hope you found this video useful. I shall be doing a second part very soon where I'll run through changing the brake fluid as well, because I know I never do that often enough. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.